our next two panelists will join the next couple of moments. I'm just going to start the recording. Uh, so welcome, everyone. Thank you all for joining us to this uh, How I Got My Job or Internship in Animal Law panel. It's being co-hosted by the George Washington University Law School SALDEF chapter, as well as the Alabama Law School Student Animal Legal Defense Fund chapter. Uh, as I said, this is going to be recorded, and we'll make that available because I know a lot of students unable to attend are preparing for exams right now. Uh, today, we're going to have sort of a little bit of a conversation between our panelists about our own or their own experiences in animal law, and we'll leave lots of time for questions and answers from the audience as well, because we really want this to be participatory with all the students. So maybe let's get started with the three panelists that are here so far introducing ourselves. Ryan, you want to start us off? Sure. Hi, everyone. My name is Ryan Smith, and I'm a third year law student at the University of Alabama School of Law. Um, I previously interned with the Animal Welfare Institute and with Animal Outlook. Do you want me to go next, Michael? Sure, go for it, Will. Okay. Um, my name is Will Lowry. I'm an attorney with Animal Outlook. Um, I've been there for about two and a half years. and. Um, fortunate enough to have Ryan as a current intern and Michael as a future intern. So thank you for having me. We're glad to have you. And it's not just Animal Outlook folks here today, I promise. <laughs> the, um, my name is Michael Sosera. I'm the president of the Student Animal Legal Defense Fund at GW. I'm a fourth year law and public policy student. As Will said, I will be a, an intern in Animal Outlook this spring. I've also interned in the past at Mercy for Animals and the Humane Society of the United States. And after I graduate next summer, I'm going to be at the Animal Legal Defense Fund uh, for two years as well. Um, so maybe let's go around between the three of us and talk a little bit more about how you first got into animal law. Um, so Will, maybe if you want to start us off there, what got you interested in animal protection issues in the first place? And then I know you had another career before law school. What brought you to animal law as a field? Sure. Um, yeah, I'll try to be somewhat brief. So I, I did have another career. I worked for um, almost 20 years in the corporate world, managing projects for Capital One. So dealing with IT stuff, website stuff, uh, risk management type of stuff. And probably in the early 2000s, um, I ended up getting a couple of pit bull type dogs from the shelter. And that sort of quickly immersed me in um, the world of pit bull issues and breed discrimination, and I got involved in animal rescue groups, and that turned into animal rights protests, and it just turned into, it sort of opened some floodgates for different animal issues for me, and there was, at one point, I was uh, running on the board of or volunteering for 11 different animal nonprofit groups while I was working full-time at Capital One, um, and then I finally just decided that, like, hey, I don't want to look back at a life of spreadsheets and PowerPoint decks, and I really want to do something. I had kept intersecting with animals in the law through cruelty cases, and I've done some dogfighting, cockfighting cases, um, and I just decided to go to law school for animal law. So that's the path I went, um, and that's what got me interested. Thanks, Will. Ryan, what about you? Sure. So for me, um, animal rights have been kind of a personal um, passion of mine for over a decade now and um, it kind of on a personal level made just good sense as soon as I was made aware of the of the issue um, in terms of getting interested in animal law in particular um, it only happened recently there was a, a professor who kind of uh, nudged me in that direction and um, that got me got me at least started on kind of a path of independent study here at Alabama where there are no offerings in animal law. Um, and from there, kind of the internship and job search and all that is more of a experiential base for the internships and the um, kind of goal of the whole endeavor of, of study. So that's kind of uh, how it got started. And the legal side of it just kind of uh, got wrapped into it after the fact. That's really great to hear. I know my journey has been pretty similar. Um, I was also vegetarian vegan for several years for law school and interested in these issues, but I, I don't think that I knew that animal law was even really a field before law school. Like I came to law school more at first to do environmental law and then very early on, like my first semester realized that there were folks doing animal law through our Saldiff chapter. Um, a professor here at GW, like you mentioned, Ryan, 
um, at your school as well. And then through internships later, I saw what folks are actually out there doing and have dedicated myself to it since then. Um, one thing you spoke about, Ryan, is sort of what resources are and aren't available at different law schools. And I know there's some disparities, but I think a general rule is there's not enough animal law content at law schools. Um, so we'll definitely get into how law students can get involved, whether or not their school has, has an animal law course. Um, but maybe a good place to then turn the conversation to is moving from an interest to experience. So Ryan, maybe you could get us started on how you got your first internship in animal law. Sure, so my, my first internship was with um, the Animal Welfare Institute and they're a fantastic organization. Um, they, um, I think that really what helped me get that internship was effectively demonstrated passion. And I think that that is something that you'll see a lot in the animal law field is that um, there's, a, there's a lot of competition for these, these positions sometimes. And so in order to really make yourself stand out about that. If you are passionate about it, you need to do what you can to demonstrate that to the person who might be looking at your resume for only a minute or two. Um, so if that means you have a, a solid chapter on campus and you can get involved in that, that's great. If you have um, other independent things that you can do, whether those be volunteering opportunities or um, paper writing or um, conference attendance, stuff like that, that's all going to essentially bolster that resume. And so those are some of the steps that I took as well in terms of essentially making a resume that at least would catch an eye of somebody who um, was looking at it for maybe a minute. Um, and so Aaron over at AWI actually was very kind to be able to give me that internship, that very first one. And um, it's and then after that, it's a little bit of a snowball effect. Um, you, you get a lot of experience doing your first internship um, in a wide variety of um, activities. And those activities, along with just the experience of actually having worked in that field, um, allows you to kind of step to the next level. That's really helpful to hear, I think, um, and definitely resonates with a lot of my experience as well. Will, could you speak a little bit about that experience for you getting that first internship and maybe as well as that first job out of law school in the animal law field sure yeah i would um echo a lot of what ryan said um i think you know the key is getting or a key is getting information on a resume that's going to catch somebody's eye um and so um, my first internship was at um, aldf i was there in the summer in california for aldf and um, aldf as our all the other groups are very, very competitive, like Ryan said. And so you really have to make an effort to distinguish yourself. And so um, for me, I came to law school solely for their animal law. And so if I had ended up in any other career, I would have considered that endeavor a failure. Unfortunately, it didn't work out like that. Um, but for me, you know, there was at the time the national animal law competition, that was an opportunity for me to go and get great experience and get to network with people. Um, we had the Saldiv chapter as well. ALDF has an advancement of animal law scholarship that you can apply to, and that's a good way to get your name on their radar. Um, and so for, for me, it was about immersing myself in the world of animal law, not just because like, hey, I want a job, I want somebody to pay attention to me, but that was the whole reason I gave up another career and I really wanted to learn it and I was passionate about it. Um, and so for me, it was getting that stuff on the resume, showing the interest. But the other thing I will say is that it's not, and I look at resumes all the time. I mean, I do all of our recruiting for spring, summer, and fall. And if you don't have good grades, I don't really care if your resume is all animal law. If your writing's not good, your grades aren't good, it's not going to do you much good. And so um, I wouldn't forget that. So for me, I went to ALDF. And then to your question, Michael, about the first job, um, it's, you know, one thing I'll say is it's tough to get a job in animal law right out of law school. It happens. There's a few fellowships. And then Michael mentioned the ALDF one. But um, for me, I went and I clerked for a year. I clerked at a um, felony trial court in Trenton, New Jersey. Um, and so that was a wonderful experience. And for me, that sort of built the bridge and allowed some opportunities to open up. And then there was a fellowship at Animal Outlook, which used to be Compassionate Rekilling. And I got that. And then, you know, a couple months in, I got converted to an attorney. So um, I think the takeaways for me are, yes, show the interest in animal law, but get good grades. 
and then just know it's tough to get a job in animal law right out of the gates, but don't give up. Look for sort of a bridge job that will maybe buy you a year, get you experience, and then keep plugging away. That's really helpful to hear. I know it's unfortunate Kayla hasn't joined yet, but I know one thing that uh, I've spoken about with her is trying to get that job out of law school, the difficulty, and she did contract work, I know, for some time um, before getting a job at, at IFA. But I also just see that Maggie just joined us. Um, so Maggie, thank you so much. If you are there and can turn on your video, could you introduce yourself to everyone? We're still pretty early on in the conversation. Hi, I'm Maggie. I um, I interned at the Animal Legal Defense Fund over the summer. I actually did a clerkship for the pro bono program. Thanks so much. Maggie, could you tell us also a little bit about sort of like what brought you to animal law as a field, um, as well as how you got that first internship? Um. I've always just really liked animals and I took the animal law seminar and really liked it. Um, when I applied for the clerkship, I think I found it on core. And um, yeah, that was it. I applied to a ton of different like AWI, um, ASPCA, but ALDF accepted me, so. <laughs> That's great. Um, thank you, Maggie. And I saw Kayla just joined as well. So uh, if you could introduce yourself as well, Kayla, I'm glad we're all here now. Thank you so much. Yes, my apologies. My calendar wasn't updated and I had the third on my calendar. So I am so sorry. Um, yeah, so I'm Kayla Vinchkowskis. I currently work as Associate Corporate Counsel for the International Fund for Animal Welfare. And I previously was the legal fellow for Mercy for Animals. I am a graduate of UMass Law in Dartmouth and a, a graduate of UMass Dartmouth uh, for my bachelor's and happy to be here. We're so happy to have you, Kayla. Could you speak a little bit about for how you got into animal law as a field in the first place? What drew you to animal issues um, and then animal law specifically as a career? Happy to. Um, so I got into law school knowing that I wanted to do something in the public sector. My law school sort of specialized in public interest work, um, but I, I got into it thinking I was going to maybe be a district attorney or something along those lines. And then during my first year of law school, I joined a student animal legal defense fund group. Um, there wasn't one active at my law school. So a group of us got together and put, and started one. And in my first year, um, we had Dana Bray speak. I'm sure a couple of people on this call might know her. Um, she was, at the time, she was general counsel at the International Fund for Animal Welfare. And I found her so incredibly inspiring. So I spoke to her after the panel or after the uh, presentation that she gave about what her, what her career was like, um, what it was like to be an animal rights attorney. Um, and I just found it incredibly inspiring that somebody could pursue a career like that. Um, so I sort of switched focus and started playing around with what it might be like to pursue a career in animal law. So I started tailoring my electives and whatnot towards a career like that. Um, I took classes like law, um, business organizations, sort of focused on being an in-house counsel. Um, and then I also took animal law and environmental law. Um, and I joined, I joined um, other groups like environmental, our environmental law association. I joined the American Bar Animal Law, um, Animal Law Committee, which I highly recommend that people get involved in. It's free for law students. Um, and I'm happy to kind of loop anybody in who's interested in, um, in joining. Uh, and yeah, so for me, I, I also tailored internships towards, um, towards achieving a career in animal law. So I, my, the attorney general's office, um, but then I, I moved towards, towards a sort of advocacy role and I worked in the state house for a Senator whose main focus was animal, was animal rights. Um, or I should say one of, one of his main focuses. 
And then my last internship was for the International Fund for Animal Welfare. Um, and after doing that last internship, I sort of knew that this was exactly where I wanted to be, exactly what I wanted to be doing. And then post, uh, post law school, I, I applied to a bunch, bunch of different positions. It's very competitive out there. So I will say, if you, this is what you want to do, don't get frustrated. If you, you know, the first place you don't apply, you apply to, you don't get, um, it took a while. I would say I, it was six months up before I even got an interview. Um, and then I got, so I ended up getting a legal fellowship for Mercy for Animals and it was a wonderful year. It was, I learned so much. I gained so much experience. Um, and then when the year was done, there ended up being a position for a consultant at the International Fund for Animal Welfare. So I took that. I had that role for two months before they were actually looking for um, a, an associate corporate counsel. And then I applied for that. And within another month, I was hired for that role. Great, thanks, Kayla. So something we briefly touched on is the kind of various um, experiences that you can get in law school um, that will help find internships and future positions. Um, something we haven't talked too much about is these um, bridge jobs immediately out of law school. So Will mentioned that you had worked as, as a clerk and um, Kayla, you were lucky enough to be able to find a, a fellowship. Um, so, but for each of you, um, what kinds of experiences do you think are um, valuable in the animal law field in the particular areas that you're in? Um, and what kinds of jobs would you uh, direct a recent graduate towards pursuing if they're hoping to eventually transition into an animal law career? We'll, we'll start with Will. Um, I, I know you've heard this, Ryan, I'm a big proponent of clerking. Um, and so I know it's not for everybody, but, um, I, I just feel like the clerkship experience, you know, one, it, it's only going to time box you for a year or two. And then two, you're going to learn so many different skills. I mean, for me, the big thing was learning like what happens behind the curtain. I mean, the law is somewhat mystifying when you're first in law school, but once you're sitting in a judge's chambers, you're walking in the courtroom the back way, you're talking to the attorneys in the break room, like you see the motions come through, you see where they get put on a computer, like all of that mystification goes away and you realize like what the law is really about and how things work. Um, and granted, it's different between a trial court and an appellate court, but I've talked to others at the appellate level and I think it's, their experience has been similar. So for me, clerking is, is one, I don't think you're gonna go wrong there. I, I do, I would say that you know, if you go clerk in like the bankruptcy court, that might not help your animal law career, or if you're at the tax court or something like that. So clerking is one. Um, fellowships like Kayla talked about, I mean, there there aren't that many animal law fellowships, but MFA or ALDF or things like that, where you can get your foot in there are obviously great. I mean, I always applied to other things where I thought the law was relevant. So there are fellowships on First Amendment law. There's like some attorney general's units that have civil litigation fellowships. There's some fellowships on public records law. There's some fellowships on environmental law. I think any of those areas where you may not be working specifically on animal issues, but the body of law often touches animal issues. And I rattled off a few environmental law, First Amendment, public records. I think those are helpful. Um, but, you know, th that's not to say you might not get experience as a firm, you know, working on personal injury. I, I think the key wherever you go is just keep a foot in the animal law world if that's where you want to come back to. I've seen so many people that um, didn't get that first job and they got, I wouldn't say sucked into another job, but they they couldn't make it back, right? Because they never kept the foot in. They didn't keep going to conferences. They didn't keep connections. And so I think there's a lot of fields. I've mentioned some that are helpful, but I think wherever you go, if you truly want to get back into animal law, go to the conferences, keep connected with people, read about the cases, stay up to date on the news. And I think that's your best bet. Great, thanks. And Kayla, I know that you have a little bit of a different experience in your current work. So do you think that the kinds of experiences you would recommend for recent graduates is a little bit different than what Will went over? I think that's great advice. Um, I was fortunate to get a fellowship. And like Will mentioned, they're, they are sort of few and far between um, for specifically animal, animal law fellowships. But 
Um, just to tack onto that, I think also um, you might consider agencies. So um, somebody gave me the advice that I might look into like the FDA, USDA, things like that to sort of get the opposite um, view because you're more about you might be more valuable to an animal rights or animal welfare organization, although it can be a hard pill to swallow sort of working for them. Um, so it sort of depends on where you where you lie and what you can what you can stomach. Um, but um, there's also there's private firms that are working on animal rights issues. So that can be a great, um, you know, great avenue. There's certainly corporate jobs where you'll learn a lot if you're looking to do more in-house type of work. There's also advocacy work. So, you know, if you're looking for more of a, a job like that, you can get into uh, like a, this either at the state level or uh, federal level, some sort of like advocacy type work where you're tangentially working on animal rights issues. Um, so there's options like that. Um, so there's there's definitely a lot of avenues, but I will also say that what Will mentioned was very important. Um, I think that you wanna make sure that along the way, your resume um, indicates that you are still involved in the animal, animal welfare world. So whether it's through community engagement or maybe pro bono work, whoever you're working at so that people can tell that that's still your passion and that you're that you haven't sort of left the field. Um, I think it's make sure that it's throughout that that's where you want to land. Great, thank you. So um, switching gears a little bit here, um, the animal law field um, encompasses a very wide variety of work. Um, so I was hoping to get a little bit of information on what each of you do um, in your day-to-day -day work um, to give people a little bit of a picture of what an animal lawyer's um, career looks like. So Will, can you give us some um, info on that? Sure. Um, I, I always feel fortunate because I get to dabble in a lot of different areas. And so I spend about half of my time on um, civil litigation related to animals. So that might be lawsuits against agencies. It might be false advertising suits against the producer. Um, it might be, you know, weird procedural things to try to get cruelty charges. So I spend about half of my time working on those cases. A lot of those are working with other coalitions of animal groups. You'll find that the animal groups work together quite a bit. Um, we have several lawsuits where there's five or six plaintiffs and they're all animal groups. And so Sometimes our role may be like that. Sometimes our role may be like the lead attorney or a second chair attorney. Um, I spend probably 40% of my time on undercover investigations. So we are one of the few groups that does investigations. And so I am legal counsel for our investigators to make sure that we're not violating the law, that we pursue cruelty charges. Um, and then I get to spend probably 10% of my time on policy issues. So that might be reviewing legislation or signing on to letters or um, you know, helping brainstorm, you know, if there's an ag gag law or something that might impact investigations. So for me, it's pretty much a mix of civil litigation, investigations, and I'd say policy legislative work. Great, and Kayla? So I'm about one step removed from all of our animal welfare work. I do a lot of the support legal work for the organization. Um, it's a lot of contract review, a lot of our um, nonprofit compliance. I do um, all of our data compliance, international. Um, we have a lot of international branches, so there's a lot to keep up with, whether it's leases, like I mentioned, data compliance. We have contracts throughout. We have grants, gr uh, subgrantees. So there's just a lot of a lot of moving pieces in terms of in-house corporate work that we do. Um, and we also, our legal team manages our um, estates, legacies, and bequests because they're very complex with our organization. So um, I manage the team that, man I manage the donor relations team um, for, for IFA. So yeah, I would say for me, I'm less hands-on with the animal welfare work. Um, so I sort of supplement my work by getting very involved with the American Bar Association's Animal Law Committee so that I can get my um, more direct work uh, on there. But yeah, so mine's, mine's more corporate. Great. And um, so these are kind of the things that 
each of you do. So I wanted to also take a minute to kind of look at the internship experience and see how those internships play into these careers and also how they support those those overall goals. So um, for each of our interns, if you could speak just briefly, just on maybe a couple of different things of um, with what were you doing, the type, types of general work, um, and what kind of support do, did that give to the organization that you were working with? So um, we're going to start with Maggie here. Yeah, I worked at the pro bono, sorry, my cat's being, um, the pro bono um, department at ALDF. So I would screen pro bono requests from people. And that gave me a lot of experience with all the different types of animal law jobs that you can have because um, there's veterinary malpractice, dog bites, dog breed bands, um, emotional support animals. There's all different kinds of requests. Um, and I got to research, I did basically the initial research into the requests so that uh, people in the pro bono, <laughs> the pro bono network could um, either accept the work and if they did accept it, they could have that initial research. So that's basically what I did in my clerkship. Great, thank you. And Michael? Yeah, um, it's so interesting to hear both what Will and Caleb done, but also Maggie, because I know in terms of sort of the types of work that are being done, there's differences, but also just the subject areas. Like Maggie is very much an expert on companion animals. And I've my experiences are much more in the farmed animal protection world. So um, at the Humane Society, I was doing a lot of, that was an earlier summer internship for me. So a lot of early in the process research uh, with litigation. Um, so for example, there's litigation ongoing that has to do with uh, California's Proposition 12, which is like confinement areas. Um, and I was doing very basic research on, you know, cases in that state. Um, and to your question, Ryan, about how that helps the organization, you know, basic research on what case law there is in that jurisdiction is always really helpful to make arguments going forwards. Um, at Mercy for Animals this past summer, I did somewhat similar work, but instead of litigation, it was just a complaint uh, sort of that we were filing with state's attorneys general, and it was more to do with labeling. Um, there's a lot of developing litigation strategies that maybe Will can speak more to, um, and that a lot of both nonprofits and private and uh, public interest firms are working on about how misleading labeling and consumer protection laws might be being violated by some of these animal agriculture corporations by saying they have high humane standards when investigations by animal outlook or mercy for animals have shown they don't, for example. So uh, I was doing somewhat similar legal research there about what do these state laws say, how have courts interpreted them, um, and how could we make arguments under those? So uh, it was very much like assisting civil litigation. Um, but I got to work on a good range of, of projects as well at Mercy for Animals. I also did some of the nonprofit compliance work that Kayla spoken about. Um, I was at Food and Water Watch this past fall and I got to do some environmental justice work, which ties into factory farming. Um, so it's, it's been a nice range. Yeah, so interesting to see how, how everyone's experiences have been so different. Um, as, for, as for me, I mean, with, um, with both AWI and Animal Outlook, I've done a lot of very in-depth research for testing various legal theories, essentially, that we might be able to use in the future. Um, with AWI, it was, as my first internship, it was very striking how um, how varied the work was. I mean, some of it is like this in-depth regulatory work, and then um, the next week I was writing a press release um, and putting together quotes for that for a completely different non-legal audience. Um, so it, there really is a lot that, that the interns do. And um, I think that it's pretty evident when, when you see your own comment that you wrote or drafted for a regulation. And then also when you see a press release, both of those released to the public, um, I think that it's um, satisfying that each of us have a, an actual role to play within these organizations. So I think I'm going to hand it back over to Michael, who's got our next. 
batch of questions there. Sure. Um, and I, I think maybe let's talk a little bit about what other things law students can do to get involved in animal law. And we've spoken about that a little bit, but let's focus on that for the next few minutes and then we'll turn it over to audience questions maybe in 10 minutes um, to allow plenty of time for that. But one thing that a couple of people have mentioned, Kayla in particular, is getting involved with the ABA. And that's something you can easily do from anywhere in the country, like regardless of what programs your law school has. Kayla, could you speak a little bit more about how you got involved with the ABA and what kind of work you do there? Because I've just personally found it incredibly useful to meet people, to hear about what's going on, and, and to get involved in both of the ABA's committees on animals. So could you speak to your experience there? Yes, um, you know I'm always happy to talk about it. Um, so I actually initially got involved because I was my school's representative. Um, and I didn't know much about it at the time, but then I realized that there was an animal law committee. So I joined that as a law student and I wasn't very active. And I that is something that I wish I had been more active in as a law student, uh, because now as a first year attorney, um, I realized that there were so many opportunities that I wish I'd taken advantage of. There's there's publishing opportunities and it's very simple. I mean, it's very short. There's it ranges. I mean, you can you can publish something that's 250 words to like 1500 words and they're, they're just published in their like quarterly newsletters. Um, so it's you know, it's an easy opportunity to get your name out there um, and for something to, to add onto your resume. So I think it's just a it's a great way to sort of show your passion and show what you can do. Um, other than that, there's, it's awesome for networking. There's people from all sorts of, um, all sorts of fields out there. So there's every, there's people from nonprofits, the public, uh, the private sector, um, education. Um, Connect with people and they they actually just restarted their mentorship program so um so any law students who are looking to for a mentor in the field it's a great way to connect with people and there's actually two committees so there's the main animal law committee but there's also the international animal law committee and the main animal law committee also has subcommittees related to all different um all different types of whatever you're interested in so there's you know companion animals farmed animals wildlife um animals and science it anything, anything you can think of. And if you can think of something else, we'll add it in. So, um, so yeah, it's a great way to get involved. Um, there's speaking opportunities, um, but like I said, publishing opportunities and it's free for law students. So if you're, if you're interested in joining, um, please feel free to reach out to me and I'm happy to help you join the committee. Um, and meetings are, meetings are monthly. So, no, it's not a big time commitment. It's just one hour, one hour once a month, and yeah. Um, so that's that's the main thing. And then the other thing I will say is basically, if your if your school has an, an, I'm sure because you're all here, you're very interested. But your school has a student animal legal defense fund or something similar, um, you should definitely consider joining. That's sort of where I where my passion started and how I was able to um, meet with like minded people in my in my school and. Um, you know, get people to come to the school to talk with other people about what's going on in the field and what opportunities there were and, and things like that. So I think it's just the best way to sort of, uh, why did I meet myself so early? Um, the, <laughs> the best way to connect with your peers. Thank you, Kayla. I definitely echo all of that. Um, Dana, who you mentioned earlier, um, when she was my mentor at Mercy for Animals, got me involved in the ABA. And it's been super valuable to me. I'm now one of the student vice chairs, one of the, the subcommittees. Um, and it's just been so neat, like you said, for networking, for meeting people, for hearing updates on what the equine team or the companion animal team are up to. And those are areas I don't always you know, touch in my intern work. So it can't recommend it enough. Reach out to Kayla if you're interested. Um, so Ryan, myself, and Maggie are all members of our respective law school SOLDIF chapters. Um, maybe let's speak a little bit more from the perspective of three students what we've done outside of joining SOLDIF that's been helpful. Maggie, you and I were in the same animal law class last year. Um, what other courses have you taken that have been useful, Maggie? What else have you done outside of SOLDIF as a law student in terms of papers you might have written that you might recommend to other people to, to do to show their interest? I also took the gender, race, and species course. Um, 
and I applied for a scholarship for a class, summer class at the Lewis and Clark um, Law School about um, animal vivisection. That was really neat. Um, I also applied for a scholarship to write for the um, Michigan Animal Law website, which is really helpful. Um, and that's all I can think about right now. <laughs> Could you speak a little bit more to the last one? What, what do you do? What do you write about for the Michigan Animal Law website that you mentioned? Uh, it was just um, an addition on companion animals uh, for the website. Very cool. Um, I'm glad you mentioned the Lewis and Clark scholarship because that's how Ryan and I met actually, is we both took a summer course at Lewis and Clark, which I did because you recommended it, Maggie. So thank you for recommending it. And thank you to, to ALDF for you know making that option possible for a lot of students. Um, highly recommend taking those summer courses if you can. And there is scholarship funding out there for Lewis and Clark and some of the other schools that might have more built up uh, animal law curricula. Ryan, you said there isn't an animal law course explicitly at your law school, um, but you have a salt of chapter. What other things are you doing both in your law school and sort of outside of your law school that have been helpful? Yeah, so, um, well, I guess the first thing is, um, well, we didn't have the salt of chapter. It had been defunct for a little bit. Kelly had, re had reached out to us to see if someone wanted to restart it. I thought it sounded like a great idea. So um, I would echo what everyone has said about kind of the support that ALDF gives to those chapters. Um, as you mentioned, there was that class, um, but they also just have a um, very large amount of funding and willingness to help these chapters. So um, if anybody wants to get involved with that and they have a project idea or anything that they wanna get started, whether it be a discussion like this or on a different topic, invite speakers, um, have some other kind of activity going on at your school those are all great ideas um and ldf is generally very willing to help with those um in terms of what what is going on here yes um there as you mentioned there's no there are no animal law offerings here at alabama law um and uh but what i've had a lot of success with kind of making the topics of other classes work for me, especially, especially paper classes. So there's, if you if anyone does journal, there's the student note that you'll write. There's um, any paper class can pretty much be wrapped into a um, animal law topic. So uh, like, I guess the one that was furthest off base for me was for a poverty law class. Um, I change the topic of my paper to talk about how animal agriculture disproportionately affects um, impoverished people. So um, that's farther off, but even other classes on um, social change, critical race theory, stuff like that, they, they all can kind of be shifted in this direction. And you not only show your passion that way, but you gain a ton of experience doing the research that um, is going to provide kind of this background background knowledge that is going to not only help your passion but also your knowledge base moving forward um attending conferences and taking advantage of any of these kinds of opportunities are great too um in addition to there's the animal law conference that is every year here in the states but uh, there's the canadian animal law conference that is um, equally fantastic and COVID's changed everything, so nothing is in person anymore. So pretty much anyone from anywhere can attend these things and view recordings of them and all that. Um, there's other volunteering opportunities that I know some people do. I, I haven't personally done that, but there's, yeah, there's um, volunteering at animal shelters and whatnot as well. Um, so yeah, these are just a few of the things that you can do for that. But um, if they offering if there aren't offerings or if there are few offerings at your school um i would say that uh you just need to get a little bit creative about how to um, explore the topics that you're interested in while also uh, fulfilling the requirements of whatever your school uh, wants you to do thank you uh, i've definitely done a lot of those papers where it's the class is like public interest lowering but i managed to make it about animals um, so I definitely echo that. I think a couple other resources to plug quickly. 
the Brooks Institute for Animal Rights Law and Policy just released the first of what I expect to be a series of animal law fundamental lectures that are free to access online. I think the first one is about property or quasi property status of animals. Um, and the Brooks Institute has a lot of great stuff. So I highly recommend you subscribe to their digest if you're not on that newsletter. Um, like Ryan said, one small silver lining to the pandemic is that everything is remote. So not only are a lot of internships available remotely, but all the conferences um, are now remote. A lot of them, you can still access the recordings. And I know, I believe for both the Canadian and the American Animal Law Conferences, you can pay a lower registration fee if you register after it happened live and still watch all the recordings. Um, and again, sometimes you can apply through your solid chapter for ALDF funding for those conference fees. Um, and then one last experience I will plug as well is your local or state bar association might have an animal law committee. I know not every state does, I don't think, but at least here in DC, for example, there are two or three attorneys uh, on the DC uh, bar who run animal law related um, events. And they've they're taken me under their wing and just let me help like plan events and reach out to speakers. And it's just yet another way like Kayla and Will and, and everyone else mentioned to network, to get involved, to hear more about what's going on. Uh, can't, can't speak highly enough about all of that as well. Um, a theme that I just kind of touched on that I think is important, and then we will get to audience questions in a couple of minutes, is getting to know people and, and networking within the animal law community, not just to network, but also to find out what's going on and what type of options are out there. Um, so Will, maybe could you start us off by speaking a little bit about, outside of internships, other ways that you made connections early on to find out what type of careers were out there, what type of organizations were out there? Um, yeah, I mean, I think there's a lot of different, I'm, I'm not the greatest networking or networker, so for me that, that wasn't a strong suit, but I mean, there are different ways. I know when I was in law school, ALDF sometimes would pro, post pro bono opportunities, and a lot of them were like, read through thousands of pages of FOIA documents. So I remember taking one of those and I met some people, um, you know, talk to your teachers, talk to your professors. Your professors often know people that they can connect you with and just express that interest. Conferences, you know, if you're the type of person that likes to talk to people at conferences, I think just going there and even if it's just introducing yourself to somebody and saying, hey, I enjoyed the talk or whatever the case is, it's such a small world. I mean, everybody pretty much knows everybody, honestly. And so, um, you know, whatever internship application we get, you know, usually look at the references and there's somebody, you know, and you can just reach out. And so I would say, don't discount those little interactions, you know, make an up, don't be disingenuous, but, um, take advantage of them as you can to get people to know that you're interested in animal law. So for me, networking wasn't a huge suite, but I would just say, be creative and look for opportunities. But as you do it, be, be genuine, you know, you're not trying to use people. You're trying to just let people know you're interested in the field. Um, and once your name sort of gets in the bubble, people know people and it's, it's, that's a good and a bad thing, right? If it's in the bubble in a good way, it's a good thing. If it's in the bubble in a bad way, it's not going to do well for you. So keep that in mind as well. That's very true. Um, it's definitely a small community. I found it to be very welcoming so far, but uh, I think you're right in that if there's someone who develops a bad reputation, like it, it, it's still a small community. Um, Maggie, Kayla, Ryan, do either of you or any of you have anything else to say about other networking opportunities, other ways that you've um, found out more about what's going on? I wish I had something more helpful to add, but I echo what Will said. I am a terrible networker. Um, I just <laughs> I find it awkward to approach people. Um, so I, I tried to just approach people as it as it came naturally in the situation um, and if it came naturally in the situation i think honestly zoom makes it less awkward because you know you just unmute and talk and it seems more more natural almost um to me to me at least um and so i i found it that i've met i've at least made more genuine connections th this way um i don't love just walking up to a group of people and just introducing myself um but that's, that's me. Some people are a little bit more extroverted than I am and can make connections that way. Um, so yeah, I've, I've found post-graduation that I've done better networking than I did during law school. Um, but, I, but I agree, like be genuine about your interactions and be intentional about how you're interacting with people. And remember, remember to stay in touch with people that you meet and 
when and when appropriate, um, you know, reach out if there's a situation that it, that it makes sense to. So that like in a year when you're looking for a reference, you're not just, you know, cold, cold reaching out to them. I mean, that's definitely not inappropriate, but if there's an occasion to reach out to them about something, I think it's nice to stay in touch with people so that you have an ongoing relationship. So if you're going to ask for a reference, it's not just sort of out of nowhere. Yeah, that's some good advice as well. Thank you. Um, I realize we're getting close to the end of the hour. So maybe let's open it up for questions from the audience. If anyone has any, feel free to unmute yourself. Uh, you don't have to necessarily raise your hand or type in the chat if that's better. Hi, I have a really quick question. My name's Anya. I'm a 3L at Pace Law in White Plains, New York. Uh, I worked at IFA over the summer with Kayla. Um, and just to say something about Kayla, I think she's a great network networker. So uh, just take take my word for it. Um, but I had a question. Um, as for fellowships, I know like the process is very competitive. I don't know if anyone has any uh, thoughts or recommendations on how to stand out in your application. Um, because yeah, I'm starting to apply now. I mean, I can, I can try. I mean, I spend a lot of time reviewing intern applications, so I can tell you for whatever it's worth, like the stuff that I look for. Um, we've talked about a lot. I mean, obviously, you want to check the box by showing sort of that dedicated commitment to animal law, and that can take the form of any of the stuff we talked about, whether it's papers or classes or competitions or conferences. Um, you know, that's one. I don't know about other groups. I mean, for us, writing is a really big thing. And so I, I've seen a lot of applications, both in my clerkship and here, that looked great. But then there are some people that will decline it. I'm not one of them, but there are some people that if everything looks great and there's a typo in the cover letter, it's going to go down the drain. So I would you know, definitely spend the time on that, spend the time on the writing sample. Um, so I think showing the animal law interests, you know, making sure that the writing sample and the cover letter are buttoned up and they sort of meet the needs. And then, you know, it sounds cliche, but but grades, I mean, our first threshold, we get so many applications that we have to sort of filter somewhere and we typically filter on grades. So if you've got the grades, your writing's buttoned up, you've got the demonstrated commitment to animal law um, and references help as well, right? If you get people that can recommend you, I think None of those are probably earth shattering, but those are the things that we look for. Yeah, I can add to that a little. I don't certainly have the expertise of hiring that Will does, but I've applied to plenty of internships and fellowships with you know, varying degrees of success. Um, and I don't know exactly what did or didn't shine about me, but um, I think everything Will said about academic success is important. I think we spoke a little bit about this earlier, but if you can get your writing out there in the world in a way that's really helpful. Kayla spoke about the ABA newsletters. Um, that's like a really easy way to get pretty low stakes, you know, 1,000, 1,500 word pieces published. I know they're always looking for more student input. There's lots of, of law reviews out there, both animal law related and just sort of general law reviews that you can apply to. I've uh, had a couple of papers published that way, which it's much higher sort of time commitment to write those papers, but I think that can be a good way to show your writing skills. Um, and then I think another piece of advice that I've gotten that I try to share with people is just knowing where your weaknesses are and trying to actively build on those skills. If maybe you want to go into litigation, but you haven't actually ever drafted anything litigation related, try and find an internship where you can do something related to that or you know, try and build areas where you feel like you're lacking. That's important too. If I can add one more thing I was just reminded of, and I meant to bring this up earlier, um, there are, I think just knowing what's happening in the field of animal law is incredibly important. And what I mean by that is like, what are the cases? I like to ask people like, hey, what litigation strategies do you think are good? Or tell me about a case novel theory that you saw. And I've had so many people that look great on paper, but when you get to that question, it's like, I don't know. And it, it to me, that always strikes me as like, wasn't worth spending the time to sort of invest yourself in the field. Um, Michael mentioned the Brooks Digest, like you can literally learn big chunks of animal law just by reading complaints and motions on the Brooks Digest. If you just take the initiative and just download that stuff and read it, you'll start to learn how people craft cases, what are standing arguments and all that sort of stuff. And so I would just add to it, like, I think you can, you have a chance to wow people if you stay invested in the field, like what are the cases, what are the trends happening? That gets well beyond the, like, I look good on paper and it moves you into the I actually know what's happening and I can practice this stuff. So that always impresses me when people know that. 
think one more addition to that, uh, thank you, Will, is if you can know specifically the cases or the activity that that organization is working on as well. The Brooks Digest is great for general overviews, but if you're interviewing at LDF or the ASPCA or HSUS and you can talk about HSUS's cases in that interview, that's obviously gonna be even more helpful. That's great advice. Thank you guys so much. Um, I had a question, but I don't know if my internet is good enough for you guys to hear me ask it. So let me know if I break up. Um, I was wondering, um, can you guys hear me? Is this working? Mm -mm. I can't hear you guys. Oh, okay. You, okay, great. <laughs> Sorry, everybody's frozen. My internet's not excellent. But um, so my question was, uh, my resume is really, really geared towards animal care because I worked in animal care before starting law school. And I was wondering if there was anything for that kind of situation where you have like a lot of demonstration of caring about the subject, but maybe not as much like office or writing experience, except for undergrad, like how to gear a resume to make it clear that I'm not just interested in the topic. I'm also, you know, a qualified person who could work well in the legal field on it? Um, well, a little bit like Will, I worked in finance before law school. So my resume didn't have anything animal on it, animal law related on it before I came to law school. So I think there's a lot of ways that you can, and I know you're still a 1L Laura, so there's, there's lots of time, but I think there's a lot of things you can do in law school in terms of internships and classes and these volunteer opportunities, like you're involved with our Saldiff chapter, which is fantastic. Um, and I think, Again, Will and Kayla can speak more to what they're looking for for intern applicants, but I think that there's a lot of just other legal skills that you can build and then talk about how you could apply those to animal law as well. Yeah, I would say as a first year intern applicant, I wouldn't be too worried about what you, what you were doing prior to law school. Um, I was a bartender before law school. Um, so I had no, <laughs> I had nothing related to what I wanted to be doing. Um, and I think just, just sort of drafting my cover letter, demonstrating the fact that this is what I wanted to be doing um, and demonstrating knowledge of the area of where I wanted to be going. Um, things like that will sort of carry you first year. And then past that, you really wanna tailor your, your experiences and your interests um, down the, so yeah, so I would say like, you're, First year, it's not going to matter what you did prior to that. But then going forward, I think that it's more important that your experiences in, in your, um, in your, yeah, your experiences in your classes and whatnot and internships match where you're trying to go. But, and I think I think that you probably have the best prior experience to maybe anybody on the call right now. <laughs> the fact that you actually had animal related experience prior to law school is very helpful. Yeah, I would, I would just quickly echo all of that. I mean, it, when, when I look at 1L resumes, I'm not expecting a ton of animal law experience. I mean, you kind of know what you're getting and, you know, you get people that are hostesses or bank tellers or whatever the case is. I think what Kayla said is spot on. Like your cover letter is the opportunity for you to craft your past experience and say, here's what I did in the past that's relevant, but not so much that like, this is why I'm in law school. This is the path that I want to do. So I would not take the fact that you don't have prior animal law experience. Like it doesn't doesn't matter. Like you're in the same boat as everybody else. So uh, I wouldn't be discouraged by that at all. And I agree with Kayla. I think your past experience is great, and I think it's very relevant. And I think you should highlight that in the cover letter. Great, thank you. That's very encouraging. <laughs> Any other questions out there um, in the last couple of minutes before we close? If not, that's all right. I, I know a lot of people will hopefully get to view the recording of this later and hopefully it was helpful. Um, so if you have another question, feel free to, to jump in right now. But if not, thank you so much to everyone, to our panelists, to Will, Kayla, Maggie, Brian, uh, and everyone who attended live. I thought this was great. Hopefully, hopefully you all took something away from this as well. Um, I think Ryan and I will hopefully be able to make the recording available 
to everyone through our respective SOLDIF newsletters within the coming days. And I don't want to speak for both of us, but you can certainly always reach out to me with further questions. I'm guessing the rest of the panelists feel similarly. Thank you all so much. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you so much.